Welcome to Things You Should Know, The Great War. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Gravenstaffel, part of what is called the Second Battle of Ypres, between the French, Belgium, Canadian forces versus the German Imperial forces. Located near Ypres, Belgium on the 22nd and 23rd of April, 1915. For the last several months of the war, the front line had solidified in the trenches, resulting in large-scale battles for no movement or change. The Germans haven't already tested the idea of gas attacks to help even the odds for them, by using tear gas and bromide, decided to do this again in the trenches, but this time they wanted to use something heavier, something that would sink down into the Allied trenches and stay there. This is where Fritz Haber, a chemist, comes into the series. Fritz proposed originally use a more deadly substance known as phosgene gas. Unfortunately for Fritz, there wasn't much of the gas stockpiled by the German army. Instead, he went with something a little less deadly, but maybe because of that a little more terrifying. He suggested chlorine gas. After a lot of negotiation with German high command, Fritz found a willing commander named Erich von Falkenhayn, not a stranger to our series, by the way. Falkenhayn, not trusting it right off, decided that he wanted to use it as a diversionary attack first, something that would distract the Allies. After some testing, Fritz found that he could release the gas in the way that was wanted, but he could not do it directly with a valve. They would have to siphon it by hand, and this would be a very dangerous procedure. During the late winter of 1915 and the early spring, the German forces moved 5,700 gas cylinders, each weighing up to 88 pounds apiece, to the front line. While on the front line, Fritz personally oversaw the installation of the gas cylinders in preparation for the attacks. During the setup, the cylinders had malfunctioned under Allied artillery fire. The second time this happened, the escaping chlorine gas killed three German soldiers and wounded more than 50. During his accidents, it was noticed that some of the German soldiers were saved by the use of miners' oxygen helmets that would be used in deep mining. Once the cylinders were set up, the Germans had the gas sitting above the location of two French divisions, a Canadian division, and two additional British divisions. The test date came on the afternoon of April 22, 1915. Around 5 p.m. that night, the German 4th Army unleashed approximately 171 tons of chlorine gas along a four-mile length of trenches. This was between the hamlets of Gravenstaffel and Langemark. This area was held by the French territorial troops comprised of Moroccan and Algerian troops from the 45th and 87th Divisions. The troops watched as the clouds slowly rolled along the ground and into their trenches. Before they had the time to realize what was happening, they were submerged in clouds of chlorine gas. The initial reaction was said to be terrifying to the unsuspecting troops. Colonel Henry Mordick of the 19th Infantry Brigade reported seeing people in front of him begin throwing off their heavy overcoats into the chilly spring evening. They would pull their scarves off, screaming, and then other people reported that some of the troops began clawing at their throats and eyes, shouting for water, and spitting up blood. This crushed the morale of both French units in the area. The end result was they ran from the area after they'd suffered more than 3,000 casualties, 1,400 of them at least dead. The rest suffered debilitating injuries that many never recovered from. Within minutes, the entire four-mile stretch of trenches was undefended, and the German infantry followed the chlorine fog, where an only cotton pad soaked in sodium thiosulfate with solution across their mouth and nose. They took the trenches and the villages of Pilkem and Langemark without firing a shot and taken more than 2,000 prisoners and more than 50 artillery pieces of various sizes. The first mistake the Germans had made, other than the big one of committing war crimes, was to stop there and dig in. At this point, the French were defenseless and if the Germans had pushed, they might have taken the whole of Ypres area with almost no bloodshed for them. While the Germans may have had the possibility of victory that day, the Canadians were the only ones to try and resist the German onslaught by collecting members of the 10th Battalion of the 2nd Canadian Brigade along with the 16th Battalion of the 3rd Brigade. Both battalions combined were over 800 men and settled in to prepare to counterattack in the gap along the next day. On the morning of April 23rd, the German 4th Army released more chlorine gas, catching the Canadian companies. In desperation, the companies, without performing proper reconnaissance, attacked the German positions. Unfortunately, as they ran out into the middle of the field, they ran into obstacles that stopped them. The Germans saw the Canadian attack and realized the Canadians had stalled and began to open fire with their own small arms. The Canadians were desperate and trapped. They prepared their bayonets and conducted an unexpected bayonet charge. 
Yes, much like the attack at Shaiba the British did against the Ottomans. The Canadians blew through the German defenders and are said to have inflicted 75% casualties as they took those German positions. And this is where the battle ended for the day, as both sides settled in for a longer fight. The final result of the two days of battle were 200 German gas casualties, including 12 deaths and 188 injured. There is nowhere reported the German losses individually for Gravenstaffel, Gravenstoffel's losses due to normal combat are reported in the Second Battle of Ypres overall, which will be a later video. Meanwhile, the combined Canadian, French, and Belgian forces suffered more than 8,000 horrendous deaths, an additional 15,000 wounded, many who would never recover, for a total of 23,000 casualties. It should be noted that by April 26th, John Scott Haldane, a British physician, spread the word that the British could counter the effects of the gas by urinating into a cloth and breathing through it. Both sides, knowing this could not be the final way to resist the gas, began development of the first gas masks. Join us next time on Things You Should Know, The Great War.